lesson on chapter 8 that was Wednesday. First seven chapters, what specifically was, was kind of the central theme there? Anyone? The new covenant is better than the old. Okay. Maybe more specific than the new covenant, Kurt. The new high priest. Christ, Christ, right? So, so really a, a kind of a specific focus on Christ being um, more better than, than what they've had up to that point. If, if you don't remember here, this is, I don't know why this was hidden, so I had to change it there. But um, Christ is superior to the prophets, the angels. He's superior to Moses, superior to, to the, uh, Christ is a better high priest. Um, and then the priesthood of Christ is superior to that Levitical priesthood. And so this is the, the typical outline that we've been, we've been going through here. But then in chapter 8, um, I think that there's really a little bit of a transition, a focus away from Christ and really a focus to the new covenant. Um, and even though those are related, as Kurt you know, mentioned here, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a transition there. If you go back to Hebrews 8, I'm just going to read the, the uh, first six verses there in Hebrews 8. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Really kind of closing the point, I believe, on, on Christ. And then it goes into this new covenant. A minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are, are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, as, as it is Christ has obtained a ministry that is, a much more excellent, is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Um, Hebrews is ultimately about... Jewish Christians who are faced with a decision. They're, they're faced with the decision of, do I continue in the old shadows of Judaism and all the things that I've kind of been brought up to know throughout my history and throughout my, you know, my legacy, or do I look to the new things of Christianity, which is really what, I, what I'm seeing now, these things that have been introduced to me. And I think for, for this reason, the author of Hebrews really is challenging them to consider the differences here between Judaism and Christianity, and he's going to specifically talk about the tabernacle now in chapter 9 and use that as, as, his, as, his, uh, as his talking point. I think there's really kind of three points that the Hebrew author tries to make. We have better promises. We, we, we just read those in chapter 8 at the end of chapter 8, um, those promises being you know, eternal life, forgiveness of sins. Um, the new covenant pertains to a better sanctuary, which is what we're going to now dive into. Um, and then it offers a better sacrifice, which we'll talk a little bit about probably on Wednesday. And then certainly in chapter 10, whoever's teaching that, I'm not even sure who's teaching that. Um, but, uh, but he does this and he, and he's starting this transition to really kind of show the differences, I think using the tabernacle, uh, specifically where the Hebrews, it's a silly question. I'm going to ask it. Were the Hebrews familiar with the tabernacle? Obviously, right? I mean, this, this was, I mean, if you were to think about all the things that the Hebrews probably held in high regard, the tabernacle would have probably been one of those things, right? Why was it important to them? Easy question. Probably too simple of a question. Okay, right, and, and, that's where their sins, that's where, where the sacrifices were, 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 were executed, right? Um, Donnie mentions uh, verse 24 in this chapter. Uh, if somebody can and turn there, uh, chapter 9, verse 24. He mentioned this, kind of summarizes this chapter. If, if somebody can read that for me, anyone. All right, and so starting to, to create this argument, this copies of the true, this shadow, right? Trying to talk to the, to the Hebrews here that, hey, all these things that you are intimately familiar with, that you hold in very high regard, 
let's talk about those because we, I know those are important to you and I think I can make a good reference to how things are changing now with Christianity. Probably oversimplifying there, but, but there's, there's a reason why, why I think that he, he does this. Um, in chapter 8, verse 5, if you, jump, if you go back to there, I'm just going to read that real quick. Um, I just read it, but I'll read it again. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. All right. Extra credit question. All right. So why might God have been so specific with Moses to be sure to make everything according to the pattern? It's probably an obvious answer there, but maybe a little bit deeper. Anyway, it's what he wanted, okay? It was a shadow of the real thing, right? I mean, if he, he's making this point, make everything exactly according to the pattern. If he hadn't followed the pattern, first of all, we know that would have been wrong. Um, but if he hadn't followed the pattern and he hadn't had the things created in the tabernacle that we're going to get into in a second, the specifics around the lampstand, the specifics around the showbread, the specifics around even the Ark of the Covenant, the things that they created that were inside the tabernacle, then those shadows, those things that he wanted people to look forward to into Christianity, they wouldn't have been able to be connected, right? So I, I think it's interesting, you know, when you, when you think about it, God had a plan from the beginning that was, that was so detailed. I think I have it in my notes here um, in Exodus. Let me see. I'm here somewhere. Uh, da, 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 da. I might be jumping ahead. Um, so I don't have the reference, but but in Exodus somewhere, I should know this. Um, there was very specific details given about the tabernacle, verses and verses and verses of, of, of details given about the tabernacle. And it's interesting that somehow, it kind of, it's kind of mind blowing to think about how God had all of those details in place, thinking about what we're doing today, the way that we worship today, right? Um, Thought question. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I couldn't skip over it. Um, other than the obvious reason of being obedient to God, why is it important for us to follow the pattern of worship that God describes for us in the New Testament? Maybe, maybe it's similar to theme to what I just meant. Think about that. I, I, I think that's hit dead on. That's exactly the, the point I was wanting to make, is that it's easy for us to use our human wisdom, and we see that in a lot of denominations around us, I think, but it's easy for us to see in our human wisdom how it might be easier to go do this thing, or better to go do, it's more, it's more um, expedient if I go do this thing, you know, to bring more people into the church building, see? Well, and I, and I think, you know, if we think about authority and submission, and you've got to be an ultimate submission, right, to that plan, which that person might not be if they go out a second bathroom or whatever. Um, but ultimately, I, the point I'm trying to make is I think it's arrogant for us to think that God here in Hebrews, we have an example of him going through, you know, in Exodus, he lays out all the things that, that were to be built in the tabernacle as he thinks about foreshadowing what we're going through today. It would be arrogant for us to think that he doesn't know best for us on how we should worship him today. If, if he knew then and could tie all that together, why wouldn't he know now 
And you think about, you know, the way that we worship, and, and I don't want to get too bogged down by this, but, you know, something as simple as singing um, with our voices. If you think about the way that we sing with our voices, it keeps the focus on the words. It keeps the focus on us singing to one another, us encouraging one another, and those things going to heaven. And when you start to add things like instruments to that, now all of a sudden, well, not everybody's playing an instrument, or maybe that's distracting, you know, I can't hear, I can't think about the words, I don't like a drum, I don't like an electric guitar, whatever it might be. And, and those, are, those are presumptive, you know, that I'm guessing what the reason why God chose what he chose. But I think we have to think about those things. God knows best, and it'd be arrogant for us to, to go any further. Jeff. Good comments. Um, Donnie goes on, I'm going to keep moving here. Donnie goes on to note in our lesson book that the point of this chapter is to show that the old priesthood um, with its covenant was divinely established and divinely annulled. What does he mean by that? Why is that, why is that important? Yes, thank you. Is that look at what God put in the specificness of the tabernacle. And then think about that as we know and have confidence in that. God created this plan before the foundation, right? So reminding us of, of that. And how much better this is that we're talking about in, in, in Hebrews. You get into this tabernacle and there's one cubit here and there and what they had to do. Wow, it makes you exhaustive just looking at Exodus 26. But look now how we come to forgiveness, how we come to being washed and cleansed and lit. It's far better than having to try to do Jewish tradition. Yeah. And, and this is really a simple point yeah. that he's trying to make. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, I, I think he's drawing, uh, it, it, he, he finishes chapter 8, verse 13, you know, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Talking about getting rid of that. And then he goes right into chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant had, re had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. He, he continues to talk about the, the fact that he had the authority to put that in place, and he also has the authority to take it out of place. And oh, by the way, to your point, Aaron, it's way easier now. <laughs> um, and if you trusted me, to, if you trusted me enough to go put all of these things in place that you guys were willing to follow, then why are you turning back to that thing that was so difficult to do when I've given you something so far better, so, so much greater, right? And so I think, it's, I think it is a really good point that Donnie points out that he's trying to point out that not only did God divinely put that in place, God is divinely removing it as well. DJ. And we're going to talk about that. It, you know, it couldn't clear the conscience. It couldn't clean the conscience. But the spiritual can, right? We'll get to that. Bear in mind. Set it up and decides, I'm tired of it. He set it up always with the intention to take it down. 
was, it's known from the beginning of time, right? Um, it's funny, I have a, a note here on this section that says, don't spend too long on this. I think we've been on this for 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to keep moving here. So uh, this is actually uh, going to be the third chapter where the priesthood is discussed. Um, and of course, we didn't have chapters whenever this was written, but there's obviously a large chunk of, of section here talking about the priesthood. Some of this, I think, is probably repetitive, but why might the Hebrew author be spending so much time discussing the priesthood? Probably a lot of the things we just talked about, but then I'm going to let somebody answer the question. It was ingrained in them, right? It was something that, that they, they knew. It was, it was probably a lot of religious prejudice, hard to give up something that you practiced for so long. There's a lot of reasons here. Um, they were probably blinded by the ordinances, um, and, and really he's trying to point out here, and he spent a lot of time on this to really try to push them forward to say, hey, all of that was just a shadow, right? Okay. Uh, I'm not even sure what's next here. Okay, so we're going to finally get into the text. Um, my plan is to tackle this really kind of in, in these four sections. I'm hoping we get through the first two today. I don't, my guess is we're going to get through one. Um, but uh, uh, we'll jump right into the scripture um, in uh, the first five, five, script, or five verses here. Uh, so somebody, anyone, um, volunteer, read. Uh, Hebrews 9, 1 through 5. All right. So the first thing to notice here, um, you know, as beautiful as the tabernacle was, we have to keep in mind that it was still only a shadow. Um, and it's interesting that the author chose the tabernacle rather than the temple as a point of reference here. So I think that's one of our lesson questions. Why does the author speak of the tabernacle rather than the temple, which was standing at this time? It was, it was still there, right? It was still there when he wrote this. Um, hadn't been destroyed. Um, but he chooses to, to, to select the tabernacle for this you know, analogy or comparison, whatever you want to call it, instead of the temple. Why, why might he have done that? Larry. Well, the temple was based on the tabernacle. Okay. It was a, a teaching on how to, how to worship God under the Mosaical law. You go back and you read about the tabernacle. Okay. What else, Foster? The tabernacle gave way to the temple. And it was uh, showing that, you know, the old law would give way to the new. <coughs> before the, before the uh, temple. Okay. So it gave way. Um, Jeremiah? And it's interesting, it's interesting to me, who wanted the tabernacle versus who wanted the temple? Anybody know the answer to that? Who wanted the tabernacle? God, right? Who wanted the temple? David, right? Um, and so it was God's original intent, you know, and again, going back to the beginning of time, the, his original plan, the tabernacle, I think you're absolutely right, temporary. You know, when you think tent, you think temporary. This was only supposed to be in place for so long. Um, I also read a comment which I thought was interesting, which I don't know if this is why he chooses the tabernacle or not, but would the, would there, the things that we're going to talk about here in chapter 9, would all of those things be in place in the temple? If you think about the first five verses we just read and all the things that are in the tabernacle, were all of those things in place in the temple? Right. 
Um, I, 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 the, the, what I was trying to, to point out was there were actually things missing from the Ark of the Covenant in the temple, right? Uh, First Kings 8 and 9, um, there was nothing in the Ark. This was, this was a long time before this, right? There was nothing in the Ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Second Chronicles 5.10 says the exact same thing. Um, so the Aaron's rod was missing, right? There were, there were things that we're going to talk about here that weren't there that had been taken away, right? Any other comments on any of this before we keep moving? All right, so verse 2 through 7 um, d- continues to talk about the tabernacle. Um, there's something, uh, I'm sorry, this, this is actually a different point. Um, it gives us some details around the tabernacle. At the end of verse 5, it says, Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Um, in Hebrews, or the Hebrew writer here, is he basically saying they don't know the rest of the story? <coughs> What's he saying here? Just like the preacher says, I've got a point, and Jesus can make really good points, but that's not the point. Yeah. <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on this, but I've got a point I'm making. It's not any, any detail on this. Yeah, so, so why might the Holy Spirit have not gone into more detail about the tabernacle? It's not the point, right? The, the point here, I mean, like the, the Hebrews 9 is not where you go to read about the tabernacle, right? The first five verses is not where, where you want to go and get into all the details of the tabernacle. But it, he's trying to make, take a quick reference back to that to say, you know, hey, well, I'm going to compare these things that you guys know a lot about, and I'm, we're going to talk about moving forward now. And so I, I think the point there is just interesting that, that this, whole, this whole chapter is about de-emphasizing, you know, all of those intricate details and really putting the emphasis on Christ and the new covenant. What it does is, you, you read that and you're reading a description of physical elements, gold, stone, and all this, and so it's, it's physical. They were, they were serving in a physical tabernacle, and I think we call that the spirit. Okay, so I want to do something here, and I'm hopeful that this works. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting, you know, just to, when I was doing this lesson, I'll tell you the truth, I hadn't really done a lot of, like, intricate looks into the, into the tabernacle, but I thought it would be a good idea just to kind of um, talk a little bit about these things that he mentions in these first five verses and talk about the significance and how those things might be shadows of things that were to come. Um, but I actually found a video here, um, which is just a couple minutes long, if even that, that just kind of shows what the tabernacle might have looked like. How many people have seen something like this? I don't know. I, I hate to ask for a show of hands, but um, I, I don't know if anybody else has ever looked this up. There's actually another video out there, by the way. There's a real replica built somewhere. I, I should have looked it up and should know that answer. But And I started to use that one, but I thought this one was shorter and, and didn't require as many cuts. Um, so here we go. So this is, the, this is the tabernacle that we're going into. And you'll notice here, you know, that, that you have the outer court. That's, uh, let me see if I can turn my red cursor on here. Yeah, I think you guys can see this. Um, you'll notice here, well, maybe you can't see it. All right, so you got the outer court, which is basically surrounding the tabernacle. Um, and uh, it's enclosed by curtains. Those curtains were held up by bronze pillars. Um, you had the, the, the altar of burnt offering here. Um, you had the bronze laver here, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think any Israelite could enter into the outer court um, here. Uh, and this bronze laver, if I can find my... Okay. Should have tried this, I'm sorry. That's not what I want to do. There we go. All right. And so the... This is obviously just showing, you know, they, they would always move the tabernacle wherever they were camping. And so you have the altar of burnt offering here, which is where most of the burnt offerings were, were done, the daily burnt offerings. Um, it's kind of gross that he's cutting up a cow over there, but sorry. Uh, there's a, you see the blood on the altar. There's a bronze laver, which is the piece here, um, which is just where the priests would go and wash their hands, either after the the, the uh, sacrifice or before, and, and before they would go into the tabernacle, they would always have to wash their hands. 
Now, of course, this is the tabernacle here, and it's interesting. I'm going to pause it here for just a second, maybe, if I can. There we go. Um, these are wood columns that are completely covered in gold. Um, I've never thought about the tabernacle as just a shipment container, but that's kind of what it looks like in my mind, is like a shipment container. Uh, it's going to have two rooms. We're going get to get into that in a second, um, why it has the two rooms. But it was, they were told that they had to cover it with certain linens uh, and certain animal skins specifically. You can read about all of this in Leviticus if you want to go look it up. And then you get inside and you have here, obviously, the first room. So this first room, and I'm just going to let this run, but this first room is the holy place. You got the, the golden lampstand, you got the showbread, the table of showbread. Um, you have the, the uh, my mind just went blank. Um, we'll talk about it in a second, the, the altar of incense there. And then behind this curtain, where you'll see two cherubim, you go into the most holy place. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was the mercy seat that we just pulled off the top. You got the cherubim protecting that, and then you got what's inside of that as well. So I thought it was kind of a cool video just to kind of show what it actually might have looked like. Um, but then specifically, uh, if I jump, if I can get it to do it. There we go. So I'll stop here for a second, and we'll talk about this. Um, so the first place was called the holy place. Uh, King James Version calls that something else. Somebody tell me what else the, the, the other word that's used. Anyone, if they have the King James Version. It makes a reference to it. Sanctuary, right? Um, you, might heard it, you might hear it called the sanctuary. Um, was anyone allowed to go into the holy place? This isn't the most holy place. This is the holy place. Was anyone allowed to go into the, the holy place? Just the priest, right? Not necessarily just the high priest. So it could be any, any of the Levitical priests, correct? Um, so this first thing that you see here, this golden lampstand, all right? And so that golden lampstand, it was made of pure gold, all made from the same piece. The priests were responsible for keeping oil in the lamps and its wicks trimmed so that it would burn continuously. It, would, it could never, ever go out. So what, and this is where I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm not sure that I love this idea, but I'm still going to do it. Um, the significance of what this might be foreshadowed. Right? We're talking about these are shadows of things to come and how specific God was when he put these things in place. So when you think about this golden lampstand and the service that the priests would have to go and they would have to make sure that the oil was in the lamps constantly and keep this burning, how do you think that might foreshadow something that we now see in our real lives in Christianity? Diligent. There's no wrong answers here. Be diligent to let your light shine to the end. Okay. I love that. How about just the dedication of keeping that light burning, right? The, 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 the fact that you cannot let that burn out. No matter what happens, you've got to make sure that it's always there. I mean, that is very relevant to us today, right? We should never, we should never get to a point where our, our internal light is burned out. Um, I think there's also some significance that it actually gave light inside of the tabernacle. Without this, there would have been no light, right? So it was actually giving light and showing the way. Um, I think could, could also be something. Um, we'll keep moving. So the next uh, thing I'll point out there is the showbread table, which is over here on the right. I'm not sure how big that is, if you guys can see that. But it's over here on the right, and it had um, loaves of bread on it. How many loaves of bread did it have on it? Anybody know? Twelve. Why? Twelve? Twelve tribes of Israel, right? It's a common number we're all used to. Um, it used only gold utensils. It was made of acacia wood, um, and it was constantly changed out and never ran out, All right? Same question. Significance. The priest ate the showbread that was presented, and so they rested the word of God and consumed spiritual sacrifices. Okay. I, I like that. I didn't write that down. I, I do like that. Anybody else? Um, I, I, I think that it also symbolizes uh, fellowship with God, sharing a meal, right? If you think about sharing a meal, um, it was always there, always maybe being the key word there. Um, it was maintaining that constant fellowship with God and always remaining prepared to appear before the Lord, right? And again, these are some of the things that I came up with and might have looked some of these up as well. 
Um, so happy to, to hear other people's thoughts also. Uh, the golden altar of incense, that's over here right next to this curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place. By the way, I should have said that to start with. If you aren't aware of that, um, now my red cursor's working. This whole first section here is the holy place. So when you think about the holy place and the most holy place, this curtain right here separates the two, and the most holy place is back there in the back, and this is where the Ark of the Covenant is. So right now we're talking about this, uh, the golden incense altar. It stood in front of the veil, right directly in front of the veil to the most holy place. Um, this is where the priest would burn fragrant incense to the Lord. I love the symbolism of this one, or I think about, or at least as I think about the symbolism of this one, but I'm curious what other people think. How does this relate to, to us today? Prayer. Prayer, I think, is a, is a really good one, right? Um, when we think about it, the priest could not go into the most holy place, correct? What could the priest do that would have had an impact on the most holy place? They could offer this incense, right? What would this incense would have, would have done? Would it have stayed only in front of that curtain? Or would it have permeated into the presence of God? And I think that's what you're talking about, offering prayers to God. right? We're not standing next to God, and through Christ, we can offer our prayers to God, just like here, through this burnt incense, they could come into contact with that most holy place. They could come into to contact with God, even though they weren't actually standing in the presence of God. Maybe Randy's crazy, um, but I thought that was interesting. Anybody else have anything else to add there? You know, it's a big deal with something relevant. I, I never thought of when you study Luke, you know, John's father, the lot fell on him uh, <coughs> to serve in that capacity with the incense. There's, I mean, it's a huge nation, one temple, one tabernacle. And so you think of all the priests that are there, and, you know, there's so many things to be done. Not everyone got to do that, even within their lifetime. And that's a special I didn't realize that that was a, a kind of a once every once in a while thing. That's, that's really cool. I didn't realize that. All right, so the next section there, the most holy place. So, so we're moving back to the back here um, to the most holy place. Who could go into the most holy place? Only Le the high priest. Larry, sorry? Only the high priest. Only the high priest. And they could go in there every day, right? No, they could go in there how often? Once a year. Right, and there's a day that we usually reference when we talk about that day that he would go in there. What, what was that day called? Day of Atonement, right? So when you hear that Day of Atonement, that was the priest going in once a year to offer sacrifice on behalf of the Israelites and, and un, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, unknown sins, I think is, what is the word it uses, um, and other things as well. Uh, what is the significance here that this was separated? This was a back room. It was separated by this curtain. Only the high priest could go into there. When you think about that, what do you think about the significance of that? He tells us what it is. It's a limited access, extremely limited access. Right. right. Only that there, there was something in between as well, right? There was something in between then, there's something in between now. What's the in between now? Christ, right? Christ is the in between now. And the access is certainly more open than it would have been to them. Anyone can go there through this versus, and we, we, we can read that, you know, what are we, um, I, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but uh, 1 Peter 2.9 says that we're a what? A royal priesthood, right? Um, okay, so, uh, get back to my notes here. So one other thing I'll point out real quick is that not only were there cherubim here, when we think about the cherubim, it's, it's these angels, and they kind of have the arms kind of out like this um, on two sides kind of facing each other. But there was cherubim on this, on this veil, this tent, this, this, this cloth in between. But there was also that cherubim on top of the ark, which was, by the way, the top of the ark was called the what? The mercy seat, right? Um, but that was on top of the, the mercy seat as well. What's the significance of that? I, I looked this up, and I thought it was interesting. The, the, sorry, the cherubim, the cherubim being there. We'll get to the mercy seat. Okay. 
I don't know that. So talk to me about that, Jeremiah. Well, that's where it hit me. Uh, when you want my next Yeah, that's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> What I was thinking about was the Garden of Eden. What does God use to, to protect the Garden of Eden and kind of keep that separation between man and God? The cherubim, right? Um, so I was thinking about that as well. There seems to be there seems to be some significance around the cherubim kind of being this entry point or a way to get to God, or you go through that to get into closer contact with God. Um, I thought that was very interesting. Um, we'll go to question two, and I can't believe the lights just flashed, but I'm not surprised. Uh, what is the significance of the mercy seat? This lesson talks to us about this. Anyone? That's where the blood was sprinkled on the day of atonement. Okay. It's actually uh, the same word from Romans 3 that was translated propitiation. He made a propitiation by his blood. Yeah. Yeah, Larry. So it was the, the heart of the of the tabernacle if what you wanted was to have mercy and to have forgiveness of sins. And that's where the law came to physically came to It's a place where man met with God, right? Yeah. It it would be the place where you, you would actually get to come into contact with, with God and, and to your point, um, yes, that word mercy seat translated propitiation. Romans 3.25 tells us we're justified by grace through Christ's blood as the propitiation for our sins if we believe, just as the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat presented, presented sins to God in the old covenant, right? Christ would be that mercy seat for us that would present those things to God in the new covenant and go on our behalf to ask God for that forgiveness. How much time do I got left? Uh, all right, so the next section here, verses 6 through 10, um, this is really uh, talking about and really focusing in on this idea of the shadow. Uh, moving into verses 6 through 10, it's important, as important as the Levitical priesthood was, it was only a shadow. And the services that they did pointed to the services of a better. So let's just go ahead and read so that we don't have to do it on Wednesday night. Um, Hebrews 9, 6 through 10, if somebody wants to do that. These preparations, having been thus made, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first sections, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, doing it once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for not and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. All right. So, verse 6 here, the service of the priesthood. Um, was the service of the priesthood easy? Very detailed, right? The priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. Um, and they can just go in wearing whatever they want. Right? No. Right? They, they, were, they were hard. These, these duties were, were difficult. They had to have certain things on. They had to be presented a certain way. When the high priest went in, he had to... Uh, offer a sacrifice for himself versus for, before he would, could offer it for anyone else. They were very hard. Um, I think that's the point that the Hebrew writer is trying to make here. These priestly services, they were dependent on and they were related to the sanctuary. They couldn't have been done without the sanctuary. Um, Leviticus 1 9, that's what I was looking for earlier, gives extensive details around all of that. And I mentioned already, 1 Peter 2 9, today we have a royal priesthood, right? We don't have to do. We don't have to go through all of these things. Um, this was limited, right? It was limited. They could, they could only go into the first part, the sanctuary. Uh, it depended on their devotion. Um, we think about today, we think about Romans 12, 1, right? What are we supposed to do? Present our bodies as a what? A living sacrifice, fully devoted to God. 
you know, here again, you have this shadow, this thing that you, you see the way that the priesthood was set up, and then you start to see how this is going to apply to us as Christians. Um, it required carrying things through to completion, faithfulness, doing everything every single time it had to be done. Um, Revelations 2.10, be faithful unto death, and you will receive the crown of life, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I'm going to use the word symbolism. I hate to use that word with the Bible because it sounds too literary, and the Bible's more literal than that. Um, but there's a whole lot of symbolism in, in all of this that, that it's, all, it's talking about what we had, where we're going, how those things are related, and you need to move away from the old and move into the new. And we'll keep talking about that on Wednesday night. Thank you.